thank you all so much for coming. Uh, are there any questions, perchance, for either myself or Cindy or, or, uh, or Jim? Yes. How long was the trip? Uh, four months and 22 days, in July to December in 2009. Yeah. Time Yes. I got a couple questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to know how intimidating it is to write a book and know that the words you're going to write compared to Mark Wayne's every single chapter. Right, right. Um, I know you got a thousand scores. I met you in St. Louis. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you were an inspiration to me. And the other thing I want to know is how you broke that path. Okay. <laughs> the broken paddle over here. Um, yeah, the way the collaboration sort of worked, it, if I would have even thought about Mark Twain or tried to, you know, try to write with Mark Twain, it would just have been, you know, uh, an uphill from the very start. So, so what I did, uh, I just wrote, wrote uh, my experience, sort of what I, what I knew, and that was, that was my part. Then I handed it over to Cindy, and Cindy was able to, uh, um, she, uh, in case you don't know Cindy Lovell, the director of the museum here, she, she lives and breathes Mark Twain uh, in the most wonderful way. And so, with her knowledge, she could take a situa any situation and she could, she could conjure up Mark Twain. So uh, at the start, he's somewhat sort of encouraging, he's reprimanding, uh, uh, and then once we get to Hannibal, he starts to have more to say, of course. And then from, from St. Louis down to New Orleans, this was, of course, his, his, uh, his river run uh, as a Cub uh, uh, steamboat pilot. So, uh, so the stories and the characters uh, and the plot points worked out to sort of fit in between. Uh, that works. I, I bought, I found um, two vintage uh, 1960s paddles, which which uh, I purchased uh, before I started. They were actually, they had been sealed, they were brand new for a trip back in the 1960s that didn't work out uh, for somebody. So so they sold me the two paddles, I, I, and I, I started with this one here. Um, and I used this one from the, from the very beginning all the way down to Louisiana. And uh, so that was my backup paddle that I had ready at all times, fortunately. And um, when I got down to, uh, to Louisiana, one of the last stories was um, a positive story inside America's largest maximum security prison. Um, but So I camped out on an island uh, the night before, and then uh, I had to paddle back upstream to the guard uh, uh, ferry crossing. And my thinking was to, to sort of knock on the... Uh, on the door there and find out whether I could get a lift in to talk to the folks. Um, and anyway, as I was paddling upstream, it was really, really a tough current, and this just snapped right in half. Um, and I, the, the canoe started to spin, and I was headed uh, uh, into sort of a gnarly looking tree that was about to, to run me through. And that's when I grabbed this one and uh, used this for the remainder of the trip down to New Orleans. So that's the part of it. How'd you get that panel back? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I, I have some very good friends in Mississippi who, who came down to, uh, to New Orleans and, uh, and grabbed the canoe uh, and the paddles as well. Uh, my bags as well, actually. And were able to hold on to them for me until I could bring them back to him. So, yes, I see him back. What was it like the ending of How did you transition back? Yeah. Right. It was dramatic. It was it was actually really dramatic. I read different accounts of, of people who had come down the river, and by and large, folks, by the time they get down to Louisiana, they just want to finish the trip. They just want to you know, sort of go as many miles per, per day as possible and just finish. Because it's grueling and it's tough. And the, the further down you go, the tougher it gets with the river traffic. From, from Baton Rouge down, you have tankers. And when you see them, you're so low down, you don't know if they're coming or going. And you have all these uh, tows, that, you know, barges that are swirling around to, to, um, to upload or offload. Anyway, uh, what was dramatic, though, was that on the lower portion of the Mississippi River, the, the river miles count down. And as they counted down, I found myself getting really depressed at just the idea that you could see the miles counting down and you knew that the adventure was going to finish. So the first night in New Orleans, I had some good friends, and we had a big party. The next day, I was on my own in the French Quarter, and I was just walking around just beside myself, sort of holding my head like, you know, what, what's possibly next? I had no, no purpose in life all of a sudden. And, uh, anyway, uh, until I, 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 I started uh, to write the book with, with Cindy. So. Any other questions? Yes. Two questions. I, I get the impression that river life was not part of your, your culture coming into this. 
So I wondered uh, what were your expectations going into the trip and how did that compare with the <coughs> results? My second question is uh, with the photography and the video footage that, that you accumulated on the right, have you compiled that into a video and narrative that, can, that uh, goes along with the book? Right. Good, good. Um, let's see. Uh, to start with, yeah, the last, I was only on a canoe, I think I was 12 years old as a Boy Scout back in California, maybe for a day or two, uh, fishing in the lake. But, but, but the idea, I've read, and it's absolutely true, if you approach the Mississippi River in stages, it starts as a trickle. Um, you know, it was, it was low to start with, and I was dragging, I was dragging this canoe to start with, with way too much gear. <laughs> it turned out that inside. I, I didn't really know what I was doing, but then you graduate. There's 500 river miles, for example, before you get to your first lock and dam at Minneapolis, St. Paul. Ten portages, and so so you may really earn your stripes. So by the time you get to that first lock and dam, you graduate to that, and then you're you're not only ready for it, you're excited about it. When you get down to St. Louis, it's a river wild. It's your you know 26 locks and dams. It's your last one. You saw me <laughs> serenade, uh, and, and then I, I got on the river almost lost it completely. The wind was blowing me back and it was crazy and I had to come back and sleep over and, and wait for the, uh, some, calm, some calm weather the, the next day. But then, yeah, so it, 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 uh, if you progress with it, then it's fine. And your, your body adapts to the river. I, I, I came from a, a, a sort of a world of city living. And, um, but, so I wasn't scared of the danger. What I was scared about really was the idea of living with nature for a prolonged period of time. But uh, it, it, was, it was great. It was absolutely absolutely wonderful. Um, and then your second question? Uh, have you taken the photography and, oh. and video and compiled that into a, a, a video here? Right. What we have right now is, um, I, I'm still working on, on some of the later chapters, um, but what we're working on now is on the website, uh, moderndayhuck.com, uh, you can go and, and actually see by chapter, you can see extra uh, photographs. So you can look at the photos and you can look at the videos that are associated with each chapter as well. Um, from the actual website. Yes? When you were doing the portages, uh, could you take everything in one trip or did you have to go back and forth? <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of going back and forth. Yeah, I average it. I guess uh, um, from, the, from the source of Lake Itasca to St. Paul, uh, Minnesota St. Paul, uh, you, have, um, you have about 10 portages. The average is at 100 yards at the football field. One of them at Grand Rapids, I think, is 1,500 yards. So what you do, and it was raining every single time. <laughs> you're just, you know, you're, you're sort of. But I think on the, the shorter ones, I average about an hour and a half. I grab the canoe, bring it over my head, take it, um, set it down, go back for the bags, and back and forth and back and forth uh, until I was finished and back in the water. But uh, I, I met one older gentleman, um, like for, on a similar portage. He would take a full day. You know, he would take the bags a little ways, sit down, have a smoke. You know, sort of look at the nature and then, and then come back and, uh, but yeah, um, the portages were tough, but, but, uh, but great at the same time, too. Anybody if if you have any physical problems at any point along the way, any sickness or uh, soreness or? It was post the confluence of the Ohio and the Mississippi at Cairo. I got back on the river and, um, and it was incredible. This entire church, I, I went to the church and this entire church took me down to the river and they were all, you know, sort of hands in the air and amen, amen, and then we, we, uh, and then I, I took off and waved and they waved and it was, it was interesting. And then I, I was going, you try to camp, I was camping on islands all the way down. You're safer on an island. There's no sort of wild animals and wild people and whatnot to, to worry about in the middle of the night. And when you're by yourself, you have to think about that sort of. Um, but um, yeah, so more island, I saw it, uh, and so you try to land uh, in time with the setting of the sun so nobody can really see where you're going to camp for the night, and that, I, I, saw, I saw this patch of sand shining, shining uh, in the sun, and I thought, that's just perfect, but right before I got there, this giant eddy uh, was swirling. You sort of hear him before you see him, and you have the giant eddy, then you have the boils coming up from the river, and, um, and it's sort of, I, I, tried to, I tried to cut right, but then I got caught up in it, and it spun me around and actually beached me right on the uh, uh, northern tip of that island, of Moore Island. So I was really pleased to be there, and I looked, and I set up my tent about a foot and a half above the water. It was so picturesque and so beautiful that I thought, no, I, I really should be on the middle of the island, you know, to be on higher ground. And I, I went to the middle, uh, um, uh, some feet higher, and I, it just there were so many trees, and it was all, the 
the Mississippi was completely blocked off, so I thought, you know, I can't do that. I have to be in proximity to the water. I have to, you know, sort of be one with the water. So, but then I set up the tent and I thought, no, 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 I have to bring it up further. So I brought it up about three feet um, to the highest ground I could on the, on the shore there. And I got in, but something inside was sort of the inner voice was saying, danger, danger. And um, uh, I had been given a 410 shotgun called the Snake Charmer, uh, made in Dallas about 20 years previous by my good friends back here, uh, the Cater family from Iowa. And um, so I, I had that cocked and ready, thinking, you know, someone might come on the island or whatnot. But then, um, uh, Woke up at midnight, and again, I just had this bad feeling, and I, and I opened the, the, the zip fly, and there the water was lapping against the, uh, the tent. The canoe was starting to float. It was tied to a tree, but it was starting to float, and the river was, was rising. It had been raining for five days straight. So you had the, the, you know, you had the Ohio, you had the Mississippi, and all the feeder rivers in between. And um, so I quickly grabbed the canoe and brought it to the highest ground, tied it up again, took my hurricane lancer, tied it to a tree, brought all my bags out and loaded them in the canoe to be ready in case and then brought the tent up and over uh, to the middle and I thought I'll just sleep for a couple hours. I slept until 3.30 and I woke up again and um, again the, the river w was lapping uh, and, uh, and <laughs> what happened was I was evicted from the, from the island. That, that was that experience. Anyway, uh, again, there were, thank there you. there were others, too. Yeah, there were some others, <laughs> yeah. I documented some other stories, too. But anyway, thank you also very, very much for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in Hannibal uh, and, and to see all of you again. Thank you. So this was so perfect. Uh, you know Neil, uh, his, journey, his journey. Mark Twain would have had a lot to say about this. And so, yes, when he came to Hannibal, uh, we always hear at the museum, we always say, what would Mark Twain want us to do? And we try to operate from that perspective. And that's why we said, you know what? He, he was like a half drowned river rat when he got here, but he was seeing him do just fine, sunburned and just crazy. But he said, you know what? You want a fun night here in the boyhood home? And so it all just kind of worked out, and here we are in tagging along. So we are really thrilled that you came out, that so many people came out. The website is moderndayhub.com, and uh, the museum is really top to have the book. And, you know, come on down to the gift shop and talk with Neil and get it signed. And, but thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you.